In every company, there are two types of people, those who make stuff and those who sell stuff. And these two groups clash regularly. In one corner, you've got the software developers, the architects, the graphic designers with great technical skills, but who are often so deep in their own world that they avoid everything else. And in the other corner, you've got the salespeople, the visionaries, the marketers who strategize disrupting entire industries but need to work with a techie to make it happen. Today, I want to talk about the most common frustrations when those who design and those who dream come together. And to do so, I'm going to use business versus engineering as the example. Having worked in startups over the past four years, I've seen engineers and business people go at it in nearly every organization you can imagine. And few professions manage to clash in just about every way from different values and personalities to different goals and interests. And even if you're not an engineer or a business person, you'll find that the stories and advice I'm about to share are relevant for anyone in today's tech-driven entrepreneurial workplace. So let's say you are a business person or an engineer, and you've just come out of a heated debate with your lesser half the first thing you should do is write out your frustrations. Besides relieving us of our emotions, writing out our frustrations helps pinpoint the things that drive us crazy. And so here are some things that you might find familiar. About once every couple weeks, an engineer friend in a startup will tell me a story like this. Jeremy, I don't know what to do. Last week I was coding when all of a sudden, so-and-so from marketing barges in to tell me she's got a great new product idea. Now, I was kind of in the zone, but I figured, hey, she's already interrupted, and you know, she looks pretty excited. But then she starts talking about how AI is a big deal. And she asks if I could do some deep learning AI to mine bitcoins from asteroids. <laughs> so I, I try to explain what Bitcoin mining really is, and. Um, I ask, why exactly do we need to use AI? To which she says, well, you know, because everyone is, but you know, you're, you're an engineer, you're smart, you can figure it out. <laughs> and then a few days later, one of my friends in marketing will come up to me and, and say something like this. Jeremy, I don't know what to do. Last week, I thought of a great product feature that would sell really well, so I went to our software lead to get his thoughts. But before I could even finish explaining, he had already begun his usual barrage of, no, 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 that's, that's completely wrong. You can't do that. You know, you're thinking of something else. You know, this guy loves to argue with me. He loves to critique my ideas, but he never tells me what's good or how to take things forward. The only thing that this guy can carry a conversation about is the boring debugging work that he's always doing. And after enough of these encounters, you start to see certain patterns repeating themselves. Debates over analysis versus action. Engineers wanting more data, business people wanting to move quickly. Debates over social interaction. Engineers huddling to themselves, and business people eager to meet new faces. Debates over how time is spent. Engineers staring at the same lines of code day in, day out, and business people having lunch meetings on the company dime. <laughs> But not all engineers and not all business people are the same. And as an outsider, it's easy to generalize and misconceive the things that frustrate us. So whatever is on your mind, no judgment, just write it out. And that brings us to step two. Imagine having their job. In other words, understanding how the nature of their job forces them to be the way that they are. Part of me gets a little anxious every time I go up to one of my technical friends and I ask them, what does a sales team do? A typical response might be to sell product or get revenue. And although these things are true, they don't tell us what it's like to be in sales. Maybe there was a time, decades ago, when the typical customer had various responsibilities, but they could still afford to sit down with the salesperson and have a nice chat. A time when the typical customer was knowledgeable about most things and wanted to know the product inside out. That is what most engineers think sales meetings are about. 
seeing the customer as they see themselves, swooning when they hear all of the appealing features. But times have changed. Today, potential customers like you or me or businesses are living in a world that's already filled with all kinds of competitors and distractions and other work. Products and people come and go, and that's just how it is. Now, as Regis McKenna points out in the introduction to the book Crossing the Chasm, it's no longer about promoting products, it's about building relationships. We live in an age of choice. We're bombarded by new technologies every week, and it is strong relationships that buffer the shock of change, not product features that will be obsolete by next week. So the next time we see our business colleagues out in dinner meetings or sounding interested in everything that everyone seems to be doing, it's too easy to think they're just being superficial. We're all busy these days, and it takes extraordinary listening and persuasive skills to convince someone that not only do you have a great product, but that you can be a trusted partner moving forward. And when the sales team hurriedly rushes back to the engineers to tell them what to build next, it's important to pay attention. They may jump to using the wrong word, they may forget to justify why they need certain things, but fundamentally, they act as our eyes and ears in the real world. And that's data worth processing. Now, it's also interesting to ask the business team what they see as the purpose of the engineers. And if you were to guess building products or solving problems, that too would make for a true but incomplete answer. Very frequently, I have a certain type of conversation with a self-proclaimed visionary who wants a technical opinion on something. And it usually begins with them evangelizing their cool new idea, and then partway through the conversation, I'll ask a question about some feature. And working in the aerospace industry, one question that I very commonly ask is, how fast will it fly? And the business person will reply, oh, as fast as possible, you know, uh, time is money for our clients. <laughs> okay, so then I'm like, okay, so, so, so I know that to fly fast means you gotta carry a more powerful motor or a bigger propeller, except some other design trade-off. So I'll ask a question like, okay, how much will it weigh? And the business person will reply, well, as light as possible, <laughs> our competitors are only getting lighter. Well, inevitably, I get around to asking if such and such speed sounds fast enough, and they say no. And then if such and such weight sounds light enough, and say, well, you know, it could, could be lighter. <laughs> and unfortunately, the conversation reaches this, this dilemma. Okay, would you rather fly this fast or be this lightweight? And they'll reply, yes. <laughs> As the saying goes, visionaries are easy to sell, but tough to please. Ironically, that engineer who was earlier mocked for their bad social skills now has to embark on the nuanced exercise of poking and prodding the uncompromising business person to get buy-in on real design requirements. It's the engineer who ends up defining the opportunity in a way that can be addressed. So for you business-minded folks, if you're wondering why engineers can seem a little distanced from the things that you seem so excited about, it's probably because they've only heard the dream. That engineer knows just how much work is left before that dream becomes a reality. And rather than getting frustrated at how analytical or negative we seem to be, it's important to realize that engineers are just doing their job. So suffice it to say that both professions are tough and important. Business people aren't just selling stuff, they're creating networks, and they're letting the engineers know what's needed. And engineers aren't just solving problems, they're defining problems in a way that can actually be solved which requires some people skills. But that's about as far as most of us will go. Getting our emotions straight and maybe getting some perspective. But there is one last crucial thing that anyone can do to manage conflict better. And that is to give and ask for feedback. To be sure, I'm not talking about venting or complaining or seeking compliments. I'm talking about a compassionate attempt to further someone's growth. And that someone might be you or the person next to you. The reality is that there are so many battlegrounds for two people to pick a fight and then to walk away thinking, ah, oh, they'll, they'll never get it. And it would be impossible to cover them all in a single talk. 
But giving and inviting feedback empowers everybody to do two crucial things. To figure out what's working and what's not, and more importantly, to recognize that conflict is really about our attitude. Now, of course, it isn't easy to admit uh, that we've done something wrong in front of people whose opinions carry weight. But a simple, hey, what did you think of my idea? Or would you mind if I shared my thoughts on your design? Or even a, wow, you handled that meeting so smoothly, can disarm and force others to reconsider you. You know, if that engineer builds the wrong thing again, maybe instead of blame storming where she went wrong, I could have given more detail to what I wanted. Or if my manager makes one more ridiculous technical suggestion, maybe I should role model how to give more helpful critique. Feedback enables us to feel a sense of control in situations where we're otherwise powerless. It turns people into individuals, into engineers who get business and business people who can help design. Now, one of the clearest memories I've had when I failed to act on feedback uh, took place about two years ago when I had just taken over as the head of the U of T Aerospace team, a student design club that builds drones, rockets, and satellites. Uh, my, one of my first tasks was to pitch a longtime sponsor to uh, give us money again. And so I thought of all the things that made our team great. The cool designs, the ambitious spirit, the awards we had won, and I put that all into a presentation. And up until this point, all the roles I had had within this club were technical. And so as I was rehearsing this presentation, a friend of mine had come up to me and said, you know, Jeremy, you really shouldn't focus on all the details. You know, that, that sponsor probably cares more about the publicity and whether you have a charitable business number. But I had already sent over the slide deck, I had already rehearsed so many times, and I figured, you know what? I was the person chosen for this role, so I shrugged it off. <laughs> and I lost that sponsor. On the day of the presentation, I was asked one question. Do you have a charitable business number? And what's even more embarrassing is that at the time, I thought we didn't, when it turns out we did. And so I spent the next three months playing catch up and worrying about my credibility as a new leader. And in this case, I, I got lucky because the finances worked out in the end. The friend who gave me the feedback was a friend, sorry, the person who gave me the feedback was a friend. Um, but in most cases, we're dealing with coworkers. And the consequences can be disastrous if we fail to ask or to listen. And by that point, you're probably in denial. I want to end by just acknowledging that humility is the price we pay to be better. And that applies to us as individuals, as well as to the teams that we work in. The number one reason that people self-report globally for workplace conflict is clashing egos. Sure, it's tiresome to constantly empathize with different people, but we live in an innovation economy, and it is diverse skills and perspectives which enable creativity. It isn't acceptable to think that we can get by on stereotypes or to think that we have nothing to learn from others, even when they bother us. I kind of lied in the beginning when I said that there are two types of people in every company. In reality, there are two types of thinking. And today, Everybody needs to know a bit about building and a bit about selling to survive. Thank you. <laughs>